Computer whiz kid. Talented software developer. Shrewd businessman. Benevolent philanthropist. Global health expert. There could be no doubt that Bill Gates has worn many hats on his remarkable journey from his early life as the privileged son of a Seattle-area power couple to his current status as one of the richest and most influential people on the planet. But as we have seen in our exploration of Gates's rise as unelected global health czar and population control advocate, the question of who Bill Gates really is is no mere philosophical pursuit. Given that we are currently living through a crisis that has been predicted by Bill Gates, which is triggering a response from the global health organizations that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has bankrolled, and driving us toward a vaccination and biometric ID solution which Bill Gates has been working on for years, the answer to the question, who is Bill Gates, is quickly becoming one of the most important questions of our lives. That answer will not only tell us about the world that we are living in, but about the one that we are being thrust into, and how we can avoid it. Today we will attempt to answer that question as we examine the motives, the ideology, and the connections of this man who has been so instrumental in shaping the post-coronavirus world. Meet Bill Gates. You're tuned into The Corporate Report. So who is Bill Gates? Some argue that he's a genius who leveraged his natural computer savvy into a billion-dollar fortune. You're called a genius, and I will... Well, no, I don't think that embarrassed you at all. <laughs> they call you a genius. Part of your genius is that you are a computer whiz, and the other is that you did have the, 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 the business acumen to, to turn it into a working company. Uh, is, are you a business genius, too? Well, I wouldn't say genius. Others insist that he is a visionary who has changed our lives with his foresight and bold imagination. Bill had a vision, and I understand it went back even then, that computing would be a ubiquitous. It would be part of all of our lives. And indeed, as you all know, he executed on that vision, and the world today has changed so dramatically, in large part, due to the work that Bill has done throughout the years. He has been hailed as a shrewd executive who built the Microsoft empire with his remarkable talent for business. When the biographers and historians write the history of the 20th century, Bill Gates is going to go down as the best businessman of our century. And Microsoft is one of the greatest companies of the 20th century. And he has been praised as a philanthropist who is selflessly devoting his wealth to improving the lives of people around the world. Bill, even your harshest critic would have to admit that your philanthropy work is you know, planet-shaking, incredible, and uh, could, could be, if you make it, a, a second act so amazing that it would dwarf what you've actually done at Microsoft. Um, but, like anyone of his status, he has his detractors. In the 1990s, he was often portrayed as the greedy head of the evil Microsoft monopoly. Bill Gates isn't content with his Windows system running just a few PCs. He wants it to run the world, spreading like a computer virus into our faxes, our phones, our TV sets, and yes, even our toasters. But in the age of the coronavirus crisis, he is most often treated like some sort of epidemiologist or leading health researcher. Back here with us once again to talk about uh, this as well as testing, treatments, and more. Bill Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Bill, thanks so much for, for being back with us. It's been a, a little over a month since you were here, and at that time you mm -hmm. said the U.S. had not hit its peak. So at this point, do you think we have peaked, and where do you think we are right now in kind of the arc of the pandemic? But in truth... None of these perspectives are accurate. Microsoft's big break famously came from a deal to provide software for IBM as they moved into the personal computer market. But the deal was not the result of Gates's technical genius or amazing business acumen. As has been quietly admitted by IBM executives in the years since, Microsoft was given their shot at the chance to work with Big Blue as a result of Gates's mother's relationship with IBM CEO John Opel. You remember your partnership of IBM and Bill Gates. How did it break up? 
<laughs> I do remember very well, actually. Um, Bill Gates, at the time, at the beginning of the, our relationship with him, was living on pizza and Pepsi-Cola in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And his mother happened to be on the, on the United Way board with our chairman and asked his, our chairman to help him. And, you know, when the chairman comes in and tells you to go help this kid, 900 people get on the plane Monday morning and they all go down to try to help Bill Gates. So I don't see Bill Gates as this great creative person. I see him as an opportunist. And in fact, in those days, there was a lot of sharing of software code. People gave it away. In Silicon Valley, they would share everything. He came in and he tried to control everything and put a price on it. Computer historians have long known how the basis for what became MS-DOS was not Bill Gates' brilliant imagination, but QDOS, a quick and dirty operating system that had been thrown together by Tim Patterson, a worker at Seattle Computer Products, as a placeholder until he could sell the proper operating system to his customers. And as even Gates himself admitted, the breakthrough graphical user interface that became the basis for Windows was ripped off from the researchers at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. As Bill would say after Apple unsuccessfully sued Microsoft for copyright infringement over Windows GUI, Hey, Steve, just because you broke into Xerox's house before I did and took the TV doesn't mean I can't go in later and take the stereo. And, as Gates also admits, it is not a spirit of selfless generosity that motivates his interest in vaccines and other lucrative health interventions. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about your approach to vaccinations. You wrote something recently, and, and like you always do, you kind of looked at the problem from a scientific and business perspective on things. You've invested $10 billion in vaccinations over the last two decades, and you figured out the return on investment for that, and it kind of stunned me. Can you walk us through the math? You know, we see a, a phenomenal track record. It's been $100 billion overall that the world's put in. Our foundation uh, is a bit more than $10 billion. Uh, but we feel there's been over a 20 to 1 return. So if you just look at the economic benefits, uh, that's a pretty strong number compared to anything else. As we have seen, Gates's philanthropic investment scheme has paid off well, with his $50 billion net worth having ballooned to over $100 billion after his decade of altruism in the vaccine market. As critics of his foundation have repeatedly pointed out, the 9 million people who die every year of hunger would be best served by securing food supplies, running water, and other basic necessities, not costly medical interventions for rare diseases. But there is no return on investment to be made from that kind of charity. No, this is not about charity. It is about control. The population control grid that Gates has been quietly funding into existence for the past decade a biometric identification system tied to a digital payments infrastructure that will be used to track, catalog, and control every movement, every transaction, and every interaction of every citizen is just now coming into view. But the real question is, why is he doing this? What drives a man like Bill Gates, a man rich beyond the wildest dreams of avarice, to spend his time and invest his fortune in schemes to control the population? To find the answer to that question, we have to examine Gates' family background. Bill Gates, it should not be surprising to learn, was born into money. His great-grandfather, J.W. Maxwell, was the president of National City Bank in Seattle. His grandfather, Willard, was also a banker, and his grandmother, Adele, a prominent Seattle civic leader. Bill Gates' mother, Mary Maxwell Gates, was a scion of the Maxwell banking family and, by all accounts, as hard-driving as her forebears. She served as a director of several companies, including First Interstate Bank Corp. and KIRO-TV of Seattle. She served as a regent at the University of Washington, and she was appointed to the board of the United Way of America, where, as we have seen, she persuaded IBM CEO John Opel to help her son in his fledgling software development career. Bill's father, William H. Gates Sr. was a prominent Seattle-area lawyer. He co-founded a powerful law and lobbying firm, helped Howard Schultz in his bid to buy Starbucks, served on the boards of numerous companies and organizations, and, along the way, had a profound influence on his son's life and career. My dad was large presence, both physically and in terms of his wisdom. 
He worked very hard, so he'd leave in the mornings, uh, often before we had breakfast, and get home in time for dinner. You know, I always looked up to my dad in terms of how hard he worked. At the dinner table, my dad would go through various lawsuits and expect us to follow along. He had high expectations. The young Bill Gates, technically William H. Gates III, although his card-playing family dubbed him Trey, learned much from his parents. From his mother's banking family, he inherited a nose for the dollar, as one childhood friend's father called it. From his hard-driving, legal-minded father, he learned the value of legalizing business arrangements. As a child, he even had a legal contract drawn up to grant him the use of his older sister's baseball mitt. These traits would not earn him many friends, but they served him well as he began to bring order to the anarchic software development community of the 1970s. At that time, software for the brand new personal computer market was the realm of computer hobbyists, people whose excitement about the microcomputer revolution and love of engineering and problem solving led them to develop and share code freely with each other. But this was no good for the young Bill Gates, who, even before Microsoft was off the ground, was already dreaming of commoditizing this hobby and turning it into the basis of a business empire. In 1976, with the ink still wet on Microsoft's first contract with micro-instrumentation and telemetry systems of Albuquerque, New Mexico, the then 21-year-old Gates wrote an open letter to hobbyists, excoriating the early computer enthusiasts who represented his main market for sharing Microsoft's code for Altair Basic. As the majority of hobbyists must be aware, most of you steal your software. Hardware must be paid for, but software is something to share. Who cares if the people who worked on it get paid? Is this fair? The royalty paid to us, the manual, the tape, and the overhead, make it a break-even operation. One thing you do do is prevent good software from being ridden. Who can afford to do professional work for nothing? What hobbyist can put three man-years into programming, finding all bugs, documenting his product, and distribute for free? The fact is, no one besides us has invested a lot of money in hobby software. We have written 6800 BASIC and are writing 8080 APL and 6800 APL, but there is very little incentive to make this software available to hobbyists. Most directly, the thing you do is theft. The letter was awkward and tone-deaf, as many people have described the young Bill Gates in his social interactions. It heaped vitriol on the very people who would be the customers of any future business, and tried to change an established culture of sharing software code merely by decree. Even Apple computers, which would go on to be one of the prime purveyors of walled garden systems that restrict users' ability to control their own computers, scored an easy marketing victory by responding to Gates's angry letter with a reminder that, yes, folks, Apple Basic is free. But the gauntlet was thrown down, and Gates would have his way. Although freeware and other forms of open-source software development still exist, the establishment of software code as legally protected intellectual property has led to the rise of billionaires like Gates. A nose for the dollar, and a knowledge of how to use the legal system to get what you want, were not the only things to emerge from Bill Gates' childhood, however. His parents also encouraged discussion about the family's charity work and the causes they held close to their heart. As Gates revealed to Bill Moyers in 2003, those causes included the population issue, which sparked a lifelong interest in reproductive health. One issue that really grabbed me as, as urgent uh, was, were issues related to population, uh, reproductive health. But did you come to reproductive issues as an intellectual? When I was growing up, my parents were always involved in various uh, uh, volunteer things. My dad was uh, head of Planned Parenthood. And it was very controversial uh, to be involved with that. Gates tips his hand when he equates issues related to population with reproductive health. The topic is particularly controversial because population control and reproductive health have been used for half a century as a euphemism for eugenics, the discredited pseudoscience that holds that certain families are fit to be leaders of society by virtue of their superior genes. As we saw in Why Big Oil Conquered the World, eugenics was a field named and codified by Francis Galton, cousin of Charles Darwin. Ostensibly concerned with heredity and what would later be known as genetics, 
The eugenicists believed that the rich and powerful were rich and powerful not because of luck or chance or happenstance, and certainly not from the deployment of cutthroat business tactics and underhanded dealings. No, the rich and powerful had attained their status because they came from better stock. Conversely, the poor were poor because of their defective germplasm. As transparent as it seems to us today that this ideology was a self-serving self-justification for the ruling class, it was quickly taken up as the great social crusade of the early 20th century. From Teddy Roosevelt, to H.G. Wells, to Julian Huxley, to Winston Churchill, there was widespread support for the eugenicist notion that society must strive to make sure that the rich and well-born breed as much as possible, and the poor, infirm, and feeble-minded be prevented from having children. A common eugenicist argument was that the scarce resources of society should not be used to support the lower classes, as that only encouraged more of their kind. Instead, life-saving medical care and intervention should be rationed so that those resources can be best put to use elsewhere. So-called negative eugenicists even took things further, with some, like famed playwright George Bernard Shaw, calling for people to be called before a state-appointed board to justify their existence or be put to death. But there are an extraordinary number of people whom I want to kill. Not in any unkind or personal spirit, but it must be evident to all of you, you must all know half a dozen people at least, who are no use in this world, who are more trouble than they are worth. And uh, I think it would be a good thing to uh, make everybody come before a properly appointed board, just as he might come before the income tax commissioners, and say every five years or every seven years, just put him there and say, Sir or Madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? But in the post-World War II era, as the name of eugenics became tarred by association with the Nazi atrocities, the talk of death panels and other harsh eugenicist notions was dropped from public conversation. Now, the quest to reduce the size of the poor population was spoken of as population control and reproductive health. Still, occasionally, these old negative eugenics ideas are revisited in moments of candor. You're raising tuitions at the University of California at the, as rapidly as they can, and so the access that used to be available to the middle class or whatever is just rapidly going away. That's a trade-off society is making because of very, very high medical costs and a lack of willingness to say, you know, is spending a million dollars on that last three months of life for that patient, would it be better not to lay off the, those 10 teachers and to make that trade-off in medical costs? But that's called the death panel, uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. It is worth questioning why this man who openly muses about death panels and the trade-offs of providing health care to the elderly, is to be taken completely at face value in his attempts to slow population growth in the third world, or to handle a coronavirus health crisis that primarily affects the elderly. That the Gates agenda is being driven by a eugenicist ideology is suggested by multiple lines of evidence, both historical and current. As we have also seen in Why Big Oil Conquered the World, the Rockefeller family was instrumental in funding and promoting eugenics, both in America and overseas. The Rockefellers helped fund the Eugenics Record Office. The founding director of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, William Welch, sat on the ERO's board and helped direct its activities. The Rockefellers sponsored the studies of the eugenics researchers at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes in Germany, including Ernst Rudin, who would go on to draft Nazi Germany's forced sterilization law. And, when the American Eugenics Society became embarrassed of its own name, its longtime director, Frederick Osborne, merely took over as president of the Rockefeller-founded Population Council. This dedication to the cause of public health did not escape the approving gaze of Bill Gates Sr. In a chapter of his 2009 book, Showing Up for Life, called Walking with Giants, he writes admiringly of the Rockefellers and their influence in the field. Every corner we've turned in the field of global health, we've found that the Rockefellers were already there and had been there for years. When we committed to childhood immunization, we found ourselves building on efforts the Rockefeller Foundation had helped launch and fund in the 1980s. 
When we became interested in fighting malaria and tuberculosis, we learned that the Rockefellers had been studying the prevention and treatment of such diseases around the globe for, in some cases, as long as a hundred years. A similar dynamic held true in the case of HIV-AIDS. A lesson we learned from studying and working with the Rockefellers is that to succeed in pursuing audacious goals, you need like-minded partners with whom to collaborate. And we learned that such goals are not prizes claimed by the short-winded. The Rockefellers stay with tough problems for generations. As Gates Sr. suggests, it is by working with like-minded partners that such great achievements in the field of global health can be made. For the Gates, these like-minded partners include the Rockefellers themselves. Bill Gates Sr. got to discuss global health, agriculture, and environment with the likes of David Rockefeller Sr. and David Rockefeller Jr. at a meeting on Philanthropy in a Global Century at Rockefeller University campus in 2000. And Bill Gates, as we have seen, co-hosted a meeting on reducing the population with David Rockefeller in 2009. But the most salacious hints of a deeper agenda are not to be found in the Gates's public associations, but in the associations that they have tried to hide from the public. Jeffrey Epstein may be dead, but this story isn't. A shocking new report from The New York Times sheds light on the connection between Microsoft founder Bill Gates and the late Jeffrey Epstein. After Gates's name came up in connection with Epstein and MIT Media Lab, Gates gave a statement to The Wall Street Journal where he insisted he did not have any business relationship or friendship with Epstein. But new reporting from The New York Times outlines numerous meetings between Gates and Epstein and a conversation with Bill and Melinda Gates's foundation, a connection between their foundation and J.P. Morgan to set up a charitable fund that would financially benefit Epstein. You know what I want to know? Why? Beginning in August of last year, a string of information connecting Bill Gates to convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein began to emerge. Flight logs revealed that Gates had flown on Jeffrey Epstein's private jet. An email surfaced showing disgraced MIT Media Lab director Joy Ito, who resigned from his position after it was discovered that he had helped cover up Jeffrey Epstein's identity as an anonymous donor to the lab, informing his staff that a $2 million donation to the lab in 2014 was a gift from Bill Gates directed by Jeffrey Epstein. As the story gained momentum, Gates tried to downplay the relationship, with a Gates spokesperson protesting that Gates didn't know it was Epstein's plane, and Gates himself insisting that, I didn't have any business relationship or friendship with Epstein. This was immediately contradicted by the New York Times, who reported in October of 2012 that Gates had in fact met with Epstein on multiple occasions, even going so far as to discuss the creation of a multi-billion dollar charitable fund with seed money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and J.P. Morgan Chase. According to the Times, Gates emailed his colleagues about Epstein in 2011. His lifestyle is very different and kind of intriguing, although it would not work for me. Epstein's will even named Boris Nikolich, a Harvard-trained immunologist who served as the chief scientific advisor to both Microsoft and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and who appears in the sole publicly known photo of Epstein and Gates' 2011 meeting at Epstein's Manhattan mansion, as the backup executor of Epstein's estate. It is not difficult to see why Gates would try to distance himself from his relationship with a child sex trafficker. Epstein, after all, is suspected of ensnaring high-ranking politicians, businessmen, and even royalty in an intelligence-directed honeypot operation recording them in the act of sexually abusing underage girls and using that evidence as blackmail. But, as it turns out, the attempt to suppress the Gates-Epstein story may have been an attempt to suppress the revelation of an altogether different shared interest. Sources say several accusers have come forward in New Mexico, where Epstein owns a sprawling ranch. According to a new report published in the New York Times, not verified by NBC News, Epstein wanted to use the ranch for controlled breeding, using his DNA to improve humanity. Citing two award-winning scientists and an advisor to large companies and wealthy individuals, the article reports Epstein surrounded himself with leading scientists and would tell them he wanted to have 20 women impregnated at a time on the ranch. The already scarcely believable Jeffrey Epstein story took another bizarre turn in August of 2019 when it was reported that Epstein hoped to seed the human race with his DNA. 
As the New York Times explained, Epstein's plan to impregnate 20 women at a time at his New Mexico ranch in order to seed the human race with his DNA, a plan he told to a number of the scientific luminaries he kept in his orbit, put a modern gloss on a very old idea. Mr. Epstein's vision reflected his long-standing fascination with what has become known as transhumanism, the science of improving the human population through technologies like genetic engineering and artificial intelligence. Critics have likened transhumanism to a modern-day version of eugenics, the discredited field of improving the human race through controlled breeding. Epstein's interest in genetics led him to sponsor a number of scientists working in the field, including George Church, a Harvard geneticist whose lab received funding from Epstein's foundation from 2005 to 2007 for cutting-edge science. Church publicly apologized for his connection to Epstein, which included several meetings a year from 2014 onward. This was neither the first nor the last time that this unassuming Harvard biologist, whose cutting-edge science often strays into controversial areas, caused a public scandal. In 2019, Church proposed a genetics dating app, which was immediately denounced as applied eugenics. Church also acted as scientific advisor to Editas Medicine, a startup seeking to use the genome editing tool CRISPR-Cas9 to eliminate diseases by deleting the parts of a genetic code responsible for the illness. In 2015, the company announced it had raised $120 million from a group led by Epstein's appointed backup executor, Dr. Boris Nikolich. Naturally, that group of investors included Bill Gates. Yes, Bill Gates is certainly following his father's advice to collaborate with like-minded partners. So the question remains, is Bill Gates motivated by eugenics? Given that eugenics went underground over half a century ago, we are unlikely ever to unearth a frank admission along those lines from Gates himself. After all, there are no longer any card-carrying members of the American Eugenics Society. The society was rebranded in the 1970s when, as the society's founder noted, it became evident that changes of a eugenic nature would be made for reasons other than eugenics, and that tying a eugenic label on them would more often hinder than help their adoption. But there was an American Eugenics Society in the 1920s, and it just so happened to boast a William H. Gates on its member roster, but perhaps that is just a coincidence. And there was an American Eugenic Society in the 1960s, when William H. Gates II was preceded as head of Planned Parenthood by Alan Guttmacher, who simultaneously served as the director of the American Eugenic Society. And perhaps it was coincidence that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation organized their London Summit on Family Planning, at which the Gates recommitted themselves to funding population control in the Third World, in July 2012 on the anniversary of the first International Eugenics Congress, held in London exactly 100 years prior. And perhaps it is reaching to compare the young Bill Gates's dating preferences to the genetic-based dating favored by modern-day eugenicists. I interviewed several women who had dated Bill just briefly, and one told me the very, que very first question Bill asked her was, what did you score on your SAT test? You know, this is not exactly, you know, what a, what a, what a young woman wants to hear. Um, for Bill Gates, though, he had scored a perfect 800 on his, on his math portion of the SAT, and, and this was a matter of pride with him, and he wanted to make sure whoever he was dating, you know, had scored a pretty high, pretty high grade. No. We cannot expect an answer about Bill Gates' true motives to come from Gates himself. By this point, the question of Bill Gates' intentions has been buried under the combined weight of hundreds of millions of dollars of paid PR spin. Like the Rockefellers before them, the Gates have long since learned the secret of enlarging their family fortune, not to mention their control over the human population, by donning the mask of philanthropy. There are many perspectives on Bill Gates. Depending on who you ask, he is a computer savant, a genius businessman, or a saintly philanthropist. But all of these perspectives have been brought to you through PR outlets founded or funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Bill Gates is no longer a subject for historians, but hagiographers. Now we must confront the question of why this man is motivated to build such a web of control. Control over our public health agencies. And for all 193 member states, 
You must make vaccines a high priority in your health systems to ensure that all your children have access to existing vaccines now and to the new vaccines that have recently become available. Control over our identities. And the lack of an ID system is a problem, not just for the payment system, but also for voting and health and education and taxation. And so it's a wonderful thing to go in and create a broad identification system. Control over our transactions. Once financial flows go underground, uh, where you have lots of legitimate transactions mixed in with the ones you want to track, and once they're going over a digital system that the U.S. has no connection to, it's far more difficult uh, to find the transactions that, that you want to be aware of or that you want to block. And even control over our bodies. But we're going to have this intermediate period of opening up, uh, and it won't be normal until we get a, an amazing vaccine uh, to the entire world. We must confront the possibility that this quest for control comes not from a selfless spirit of generosity that never seemed to exist before he became a multi-billionaire, but from the same drive for money, the same desire for domination, and the same sense of superiority that motivated him on his way up the corporate ladder. But if the answer to the question, who is Bill Gates, is Bill Gates is a eugenicist. That tells us some important things about the world that we are living in. It tells us that Gates is deceiving the public into supporting his takeover of the world with a false front of philanthropy. It tells us that the goal of the Gates, like the goal of the Rockefellers before them, is not to improve the world for humankind, but to improve the world for their kind. And most importantly, it tells us that Bill Gates is no comic book supervillain, single-handedly directing all of the chaos that is unfolding in the world or single-handedly bringing his own order to that chaos. No, if Bill Gates is a eugenicist, driven by a belief in the superiority of himself and his fellow wealthy elitists, then what we are facing is not one man, or even one family, but an ideology. This is not a trivial point. One man, whatever his wealth, can be stopped easily enough. But even if Bill Gates were to be thrown in jail tomorrow, the agenda that has already been set in motion would continue without missing a beat. An entire infrastructure of researchers, labs, corporations, governmental agencies, and public health bodies exists, funded more often than not by Gates, but driven by the belief of all those millions of people working for these various entities that they are truly working in the best interest of the people. No, an ideology cannot be stopped by stopping one man. It can only be stopped when enough people learn the truth about this agenda and the world of total, pervasive control that is coming into view. If you have watched all four parts of this exploration on Bill Gates, then you are now one of the most informed people on the planet about the true nature of this agenda. You have seen how the takeover of public health has been used to railroad the world into a headlong rush toward mandatory vaccinations, biometric identification, and digital payments. You have seen how the pieces of this puzzle fit together, and how they represent a far greater threat to the future of humanity than any virus. Here is the good news. Armed with this information, you have the antidote to the scourge of this eugenicist ideology. The truth is that ideologies are viruses of the mind. They spread from person to person, infecting them with ideas that can lead to a disease of the body politic. But here is the even greater truth. Inoculations do work. Inoculations of truth against the lies of those spreading their poisonous ideology. If you have made it this far, it is incumbent on you to help inoculate those around you against the corrupt ideology of Bill Gates and all those who seek to control the population of the world. You must help to spread this information so that others have a chance to see the bigger picture and decide for themselves whether they are willing to roll up their sleeves and accept what is coming or not. But time is not on our side. Even as we speak, mass vaccination campaigns are being prepared. We are already building our plans to vaccinate the whole city of Chicago and working with others across the region on a major plan for this. We've bought syringes, we've bought cold boxes, we've planned out locations. 
biometric identification schemes and immunity passports are already being rolled out. And so while we started with travel at our core, we're a biometric secure identity platform where it's always been about attaching your identity to your boarding pass, the airport, or your ticket to get into a sports stadium or your credit card to buy a beer. And so now with the launch of Clear Health Pass, it's about attaching your identity to your COVID-related health insights for employers, for employees, for customers. Programs for tracking, tracing, and surveilling the entire population are already being beta tested. Today we are launching another useful tool that can supplement the critical detective work we are conducting in public health. Alberta Trace Together is a voluntary, secure, mobile contact tracing application to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. And the digital payment infrastructure the system of financial exclusion that will allow governments to turn off our access to the economy at will is being put into place. In order to avoid the risk of transmission through physical handling of money, we encourage the use of cashless transactions such as mobile money, m and otherwise, and credit cards People are using touchless payment systems much more than they're using cash, both because we're not interacting with people directly as much anymore, and also because cash is kind of skeezy. We must spread the word about the dark nature of this population control agenda to as many people as we can, before our ability to speak out against this agenda is taken away for good. Thanks to the likes of Bill Gates, the virus of this population control agenda is already here. It is threatening to crash the system as we've known it. But if Bill Gates has taught us anything, applications like Word and Excel, how it's how to deal with a virus. It's time for a hard reset. Thank <laughs> you.